Um, do I do that with all my scripts? No. Should I? Yes. But I'm on a tight deadline and I have no backlog on videos. Ladies, gentlemen, and those with the good sense to do away with the whole notion, I welcome you to the premier audio medium for all your Fazbear entertainment needs. The Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast. Note, FFPP is not responsible for any loss of appetite, disinterest, dismemberment, or other legally classified statuses. So strap in and enjoy. Well, this is something different. Hey, everybody. It's me, Rytos, one of the many FNAF creators on this platform. I was looking around, and there are a couple podcasts on FNAF. I saw maybe one or two. I'm pretty sure Demuta just started his up. If not, sorry, I hope that's not a spoiler. No, I think he did. He did start his up. And there's... um like one or two others, I didn't see a lot of podcasts for this. And I'm like, I know a lot of people wanted longer form content. So I was like, hey, I like doing voice work and like talking at length and I can talk at length about this Pizza Bear game. So what if I did a podcast? Now, you might be watching this as a video or you might be an audio listener. I'm providing both the videos on YouTube, the audio is everywhere else. Um, I don't know how this is going to go and I don't really know what the format of this is going to be because I've really never done a podcast. Now, in the past, I had tried doing podcasts a few times back when I was trying to find my footing. But the problem with those is that it was too broad. Like, I remember for a while I wanted to make a podcast on just like gaming news in general. And then it was I was I was worried that if I narrowed myself, then it would be hard to kind of make that work as a podcast because I would run out of things to talk about. But Almost in being too broad, there was too much to talk about, and I had a hard time narrowing, and I had a hard time picking topics, frankly. So this is kind of going to be uh, jumping into the deep waters, you and me, me and you. Granted, I don't know you, don't be parasocial, but you know. Um, but expect from this podcast, Five Nights at Freddy's Talk, occasionally some other indie horror uh, I'm hoping to get a lot of guests on. I've already had a couple DMs, some really fun creators who I would love to collab with. Um, but yeah, the main purpose of this podcast is just to be talking about Five Nights at Freddy's. You know, it's going to be very low edited, if at all. If there's a cut, it's probably just going to be because something happened and I had to cut it out of the recording. Um, it's just going to be kind of like your background noise, if anything. So hopefully... You can maybe learn a thing or two or, or correct me on a thing or two about FNAF. And we'll just talk about the state of the lore, um, the state of the games coming out, the process of content creation, just everything in that area, you know. And as far as topics go, I figured for each episode, I'm going to pick a topic and then I'm going to do questions from the audience. And I feel like that makes the most sense for a podcast format. Now, when I have a guest, I'll have them pick the topic. But as far as when it's just you and me, we'll be doing, I'll, I'll be the one to pick the topic. So the topic for today's video, I already kind of started on it, is like, hey, why are you making a podcast? And it also bleeds into one of the questions that we have for today. So moving forward, and I'll say this again at the end of every episode, but if you have any questions that you want answered on the podcast or people you want me to reach out to, um, right now I'm just having people reach out to me because it's easier to like start by having people reach out to me. Um, but the email's in the description. I'll put it right here in the video if I remember. It's Freddy Fazbear Pizza Podcast. Um, and you can just ask questions there. You can and just ask questions or submit like, oh, you should collab with X on there and do it there so it can consolidate it. Because I've had people in my DMs like on Twitter being like, hey, can you collab with X? I'm like, oh, I'll look into it. And then I have ADHD brain. So like once I stop looking at it, it's gone. It just disappears. <laughs> so I, I figured giving it its own email where all the things about this podcast go to will help me focus on it. But other than that, like why a podcast? I found that I really like making content um, almost too much. Like it's one of the most fun I've had in any kind of like job for one, but just creation in general. It's so creatively fulfilling to make a product and make it enjoyable to watch and fun to listen to. And I, I just, I wanted to do different forms of that. And I saw a hole in the podcast space. So I was like, let me try to fill that hole. Um, it's part of the reason why I started doing FNAF theories in general, because I'm not to say that nobody was doing FNAF theories. A bunch of people were doing FNAF theories, but I, 
I saw a distinct lack in a variety of timelines. Back when I made my first timeline for the channel, really the only FNAF timelines on YouTube that I could find was either Game Theory, I think Hyperdroid had one, um, I think FNAF just did the history of FNAF, which wasn't like a lore timeline, but still, it's very similar. Um, and there was like a couple things like that, but there was only like, there was less than 10, I, I felt like, of like fully produced timelines per channel. Um, so I was like, well, what if I do mine? And I I know Security Breach was coming out at the time. So back when I, I primarily streamed on Twitch, and I would post clips on YouTube. I streamed all the FNAF games and in the background was working on my timeline video. And then when I put out that timeline video, it kind of blew up. Like it got 100,000 views in a couple months. Like the initial first week, it got like 10, 20,000 views. I was like, this is crazy. We're doing YouTube now. And I immediately did the smart thing of, well, if a FNAF video blew up, I should do another FNAF video. That's the smart thing to do. I didn't do that, actually. I lied. The very next video I made was a movie prediction for Sonic 2, um, <laughs> and it flopped. And I was like, okay, we're doing FNAF. <laughs> like, and I, I, I do try to differentiate the content on the channel. That's kind of what the second channel is primarily for. It's like a, a creative outlet for me to do other topics that aren't just Five Nights at Freddy's or even horror to an extent. Um, but... Once I knew that like FNAF was the main draw of this channel, I'm like, okay, let me buckle down on that. Because frankly, I that around that time, I decided I really wanted to go hard with YouTube and really hone in on it. And it was either going to be Five Nights at Freddy's or Pokemon, because those are like my two hyperfixations throughout all time. Like I cycle through hyperfixations a lot, but the two that have been consistent for a very long time have been Pokemon and Five Nights at Freddy's. And I I mean, because of that, there's probably going to be a lot of Pokemon content on the second channel, so be, be ready for that. Um, but as far as Five Nights at Freddy's goes, once the timeline blew up and I realized that those the FNAF videos were the ones that were doing well, I was like, okay, let's stick with this. And since then, being able to do shorts and streams and have such a wonderful community around uh, all, this thing, all these things that I'm creating about this franchise we all love, it's just been a blessing. And when I thought about like what else I can do to provide content and to uh, continue the conversation moving forward, I was like, well, a lot of us right now, for the most part, will do short form like shorts or we'll do like medium form edited videos. And especially in the theory space, a lot get a lot gets missed or left on the cutting room floor in that aspect like i'll make a, a 60 second short where i'll just like tease a theory and people will dissect it with a five paragraph comment and don't get me wrong i'm very grateful for the comments but i, I it just it reinforces that idea of trying to get across such a complex idea in such a short time just isn't super feasible you know what i mean so for one, the podcast is kind of a way to delve way, 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 way deeper into a theory than I could on a short or even a long form edited video uh, like I do weekly. Um, but another thing was just to have kind of a more casual form of content. The content that I produce right now is very highly edited. All the main channel stuff is edited by me, the shorts and the videos, the second channel, all those um, videos are edited by people I, I've hired like Queen Coda, like Codex. Uh, I just realize that both of their names kind of almost like the beginnings rhyme the coda and codex that's that's kind of funny i didn't do that on purpose um but yeah so like all of that is like really highly edited and i love to create that and i love to produce that but part of me did have that want of like i want a more laid back content something that because uh, that's a niche that I have not hit as a channel yet. Like I have the streams and they're more casual, but that's just because they're live and it's not necessarily like as content as a video would be. The streams feel more like an excuse for me to play a video game and hang out with the community rather than like an edited piece of content. And this is still edited, like there's the background and things like that, but it's not going to be like when I make a main channel video, I cut out every breath like I. So I, I guess we'll transition um, a bit into the questions now because I've been talking for almost 10 minutes about just like the podcast um, and we can transition to one of the questions. But one of the questions, uh, the, the questions for this first episode are all from Twitter because I was teasing out this podcast for a few weeks and one of those tweets, I was like, hey, 
if I was going to do like long form content, what's a question you would want answered? So I grabbed a couple of them and I, f I thought these would be great questions for like the first episode because they're very like broad in like just FNAF in general and content in general. Like right there. You remember I said there'd be some cuts? I burped. I'm not going to leave those in. Um, but the, one of the questions we'll start with is um, from at Badinator on Twitter. Um, also just Badinator on Twitter. Uh, I'm curious to know what your process of coming up with a theory is, if you're comfortable discussing that, of course. Let's go deep into that. Let's not just do coming up with a theory. Let's do the whole video, right? I make a weekly theory video. I almost said a weekly video every week. I make a theory video every single week, and I've missed, I think, one video since I've started. So that's uh, ooh, like 74, 75 theory videos that I, I have been hitting weekly, and it is draining, uh, but I love it. So, you know, it's one of those things where I get energy from doing it. So it's not necessarily like taking energy away. I just realized my bottles in the shot. So let's go into like the my whole process. And is it the best process? No, definitely not. Is it the correct process? I don't think there is a, such a thing, but it's a process that's worked for me. And I, I get a lot of questions on Twitter and during streams of like, oh, what's some advice with content creation? And my, my go-to answer has always been for content creation in any form, one, don't listen to me. I don't know what I'm talking about. But two, there are people out there that do know what they're talking about. But three, and most importantly, there are people that don't know what they're talking about, but will have you pay them to talk to you like they know what they're talking about. So the first tip has always been, if someone is selling a course on content creation, don't buy it. That's their, it's like, it's selling a course online for something as niche and specific as content creation is immediately sketched to me. Like, I do not trust that at all. Are there probably some good course sellers out there? Yes. Nine times out of 10, you're just going to get scammed because you're going to pay $200 a month and they're going to be like, make sure you pick something you're passionate about. There are so many free resources that you can do. For example, my highly recommended free resources for like content creation if you're just starting out in the space and you want good advice, um, there's a YouTube channel called Stream Scheme. Um, it's by this Australian guy named uh, LJ. LJM is uh, his personal, uh, his like gaming channel. But um, really good advice on there. I think that's probably some of the best content focused advice. Some of the best advice about like how you should. Uh, how, best, not how you should, but like best practices for picking a topic for a video or um, ways to present during stream so you're not kind of boring your viewers and things like that. For more algorithmically focused advice, I would go to a channel like vidIQ. Um, I found that they're really good. Now they do have a paid subscription for like their, uh, plugin and their courses. You don't have to do any of that. They have a YouTube channel that's already really, really useful in like good thumbnail practices, good end screen practices. And they do a lot of live streams too, where they just like talk back and answer questions. So I highly recommend vid IQ for uh, algorithmic focused things. And then as far as like the technicals, like editing, I usually recommend Finzar. Now Finzar's style of editing is more like high energy gaming focused, like more closer to a Mr. Beast video almost, but, uh, and that's F-I-N-Z-A-R if I didn't spell it. But, um, but even if you don't do that style, like I don't do that style, but I learned a lot of really good, good editing tips from his videos and you can just pick and choose you know like don't watch a video and be like hey this is how you edit a video and then just absolutely copy that but like look at that take it and like learn from it it's the the classic saying i think this was stream scheme who said it but the classic saying of content creation if you want to get really good at it which i'm not even saying i am yet maybe one day but if you want to get really good at it, you want to practice the yoink and twist where if someone has a really good idea and they do it and it's really and it's received well and it looks fun to do, um, then I just realized I'm blocking my microphone monitor. OK, cool. I am recording. Love that for me. Um, then you see that you yoink it, but don't copy it. You take that idea and you put your own twist on it. Like, for example, on that channel, LJM, he did one where he hatched 100 eggs to just see what would happen as like a video idea. And it was really cool. But the twist of it was it was more narratively focused, where it was like the story of doing that rather than just like hatching a bunch of eggs, you know. Um, so that's something you really want to look into. But all that aside, let's actually get to the question from Badinator. I'm curious to know what your process of coming up with a theory is, if you're comfortable discussing that, of course. So here's my process, start to finish from 
uh, re- like from before I think of the theory to the Friday it's posted. Like that, here's the whole process that I go through on a weekly basis. One of the things that helps me come up with theories is just, um, it, it's also the best way to learn a language, frankly, and it's complete immersion. Just being surrounded by the stuff. Uh, I feel like one of the best ways to come up with theories for FNAF is just to consume a lot of FNAF content. But I'm talking the books, I'm talking the games, I'm talking the uh, a surrounding content of Five Nights at Freddy's. So I'm talking watching about uh, watching other people's videos going on the subreddit. Just being immersed and entrenched in this community and the ideas in it and the 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 ideas from the games themselves and the evidence and all that, that will help your mind to connect things. Like that's why um, in my most recent theory video, I make that help wanted to connection where um, when I was reading Didophobia or at least the live reading of Didophobia, um, that line came up where Rory was like, ah, yes, the calming shushing above my bed, hissing the gas into it or, or whatever the line was. I don't think he knew it was gas at the time. But like when I read that, because I'm so entrenched in this content, my brain first went to, I remember talking to a friend about the Help Wanted 2 trailer, how I thought that hissing at the end was a shushing sound. I remember that. Let me go listen to that again. And I listened to it. I was like, that is like a hissing, shushing sound, which could be nightmare gas, especially considering that's sister location, you know, and that felt really strong. But that that kind of connection only really comes from just having these things bouncing around your head all the time, um, or at least a lot of the time. It's It's classic brainstorming, right? But once a theory comes to mind like that, right, like having a bunch of things come up and waiting for a connection to spark in the brain and following that rabbit hole, once that spark happens, let's let's just stick with the Help Wanted 2, for example. So once that spark of Didophobia and Help Wanted 2 happens, I, then the questions start to happen. If it's the why, right? And I got this from improv. I did four years of improv in college. It was some of the funnest things I've ever done in my life. I highly recommend it for any creatives out there. Even if you don't like doing comedy, doing improv, which is 90% comedy, but doing improv in some form, I think is so, so, so helpful for a creative mind. It allows you to think on the fly. It helps you to make better connections and to be just a quick wit, which even in horror, in tragedy, having a fast wit is always helpful. Um, But one of the things I got from improv was asking the why or the like the so what. So when I... Again, to go with Help Wanted 2 and Didophobia. When I saw that line, Rory being like, oh, it sounds like a shushing. I go back to the trailer. I listen. I hear the shushing. My immediate next question is like, okay, if that's true, so what? What does that change about Didophobia or Help Wanted 2? Right? And then follow that down. So with Didophobia, it doesn't change much. We already know it's gas. But in Help Wanted 2, that changes a lot. Because Help Wanted 2, we all assumed, would be another in-universe VR game, for the most part. Like, it it made sense to do it that way. Um, But if that's nightmare gas being leaked in from the FNAF 4 testing rooms, everything changes. The whole point of Help Wanted is a collection of mini-games and situations from the main series games. And that really can only happen if you're going to make it a real thing in-universe, besides, like, UCN or something in a VR game or a similar video game thing in universe. But once you introduce nightmare gas that can induce hallucinations, suddenly any of this is possible. Like any of that could be in the real world based on the hallucinations the player is having. So then that goes down that rabbit hole and like, okay, well, if that's true, then what would that mean for the game? So for me, making a theory, like just the theory itself comes to finding a connection that feels really strong, asking why it would matter, and then finding supporting evidence along the way. And the thing about Five Nights at Freddy's, and one of the things that excites me the most about it, is it's such an open and in-the-air conversation and franchise, because we have so little definitive answers that a lot of different theories that could be completely contradictory with each other can both separately be valid. So like there could be, I, I, I've hold, I've held very strong. I said this on the Game Theory live stream. I said this a lot. Ooh. I've said this a lot. I think that we are at a point in this franchise where you could make like three, four, five, even six 
different full Fazbear timelines that are completely separate from one each other. And it would still, all of them could be equally valid. Like, just using the assumptions. Because the assumptions in this franchise are where our theories come from, right? We have so little, so little definitive evidence on anything. A lot of it is speculation and a lot of it is assumptions. So the theories that we make in this franchise are, like, for the most part, based on what assumptions we're willing to make, you know? So that's one of the things that I find really particularly interesting about Five Nights at Freddy's. Um, but once the theory has been made, right, and the theory the theory isn't done ever, right? That's, the, that's why they're theories. They change constantly. So you could write an entire five, six-page theory, and then a week later you could look at it and be like, well, I actually don't like that. But I do like this other thing, and you add an addendum, let alone when you put it out into the public, and then a, thousands of people will look at it and be like, oh, I like this theory, but have you considered this? Or, oh, I don't like this theory because you considered this. You know, so the theory is always changed. They never stay consistent. That's the point of a theory. But for content creation, once I've made a theory, then it goes to the writing stage. And it's at this point that I'll just hunker down, open a Google Doc, and just go. Um, my form of writing comes from my procrastination. If you couldn't tell, I've ADHD. Like I've got, I just got this fidget the other day. I'm loving it. It's like a little gyroscope with, um, like a uh, bumpy, sh almost sharp edges. I love this thing. My, my ring on my second hand is a fidget ring as well. Like <laughs> I have really bad ADHD. Um, but because of that, I have really bad procrastination. So I'm a speed writer. Um, I, it's from my English degree. Anytime I had an essay, I'd write it the night before and I would pump it out. So that still holds with me. So when I write a script, I usually like get all the ideas in my head, ready to go. I sit down at a Google doc and for like three to four hours, I just write. And by the time I'm done, there's a six or seven page script there. Um, for best practices, you would want to write. I think writing a script is best done with stream of consciousness, just start writing and don't stop until you're done. And if you want to have a good script, take a step back for a day, maybe a couple days, let it rest, then reread your script. You will find issues you have with it. You will find errors you've made. And if you've done that and you think you're good, give it one more day. Here's the real secret tip. I Trust me, this will make your writing 10 times better. Wait one more day. And then put a text-to-speech filter on your script. When not, not you read it out loud. Have a robotic voice that does not understand context read it out loud. If it trips up, if it sounds awkward, you will hear it. It will be exaggerated. And then go back and fix those issues. Um, do I do that with all my scripts? No. Should I? Yes. But I'm on a tight deadline and I have no backlog on videos. Something a lot of people don't realize. Like... A good YouTube practice, you should have like three or four weeks of backlogged videos prepped. Or at least like however frequently you upload, if you upload bi bi-monthly, bi-weekly, you should have about four to five videos in a backlog ready to go in like so that you have time in case something comes up before your videos do. I don't have one of those. I want one of those, but it takes me like 30 hours to make a video and I make a weekly video. So I don't have a backlog. Um, maybe one day. I also have two kids, so I'm a very, very, very busy person. Um, but because I don't have a backlog, I don't really have the time to dedicate to proofing and reproofing a script. So I just have been writing on hoping the script is good enough and improving fixes on the fly while I record, which again, improv coming in handy. Um, but once the script is done, I usually then will sit down, record it, similar to this, although my recording sessions are usually not this long, and I'm getting sweaty because I'm in a dark room with two lights there, a light behind me, so it pops my highlight so I don't blend into the background, two color lights, and now more light decorations. Am I sweating? Oh, it's starting to come up. Yeah, I'm I'm the kind of guy who my, my, my body cries first when I start sweating. Um, but anyway, enough about sweat. Uh... Once I record, it usually takes me about 30 to 40 minutes to do a full recording session for an entire 20 minute video. And the way I do it, because I hate pulling up and down my green screen back there, I'll record all of the live action section, like the, the non green screen section first as one big chunk of video. And I'll just leave the outtakes in. I'll just leave all that in. Finalize that. 
put that video file to the side and then I'll pull up the green screen, change the lighting, get all that ready. And then I'll do the green screen section in all one big chunk, leaving all the outtakes in. And then I'll end that. So I end up with two video files and then I pump them both into uh, Adobe Audition. I use the full Adobe suite when I make videos. I think it's just, it's expensive, but I think it's really powerful for what it is. But I'll put both video files into Audition and then I'll, I'll, I'll tweak the audio um, I have a set preset for what I do for my videos. It's typically I will do a parametric equalizer filter. I'm getting really into the nitty gritty, so I hope you guys want this. I'll go to the parametric equalizer filter where I t where it um, just takes some of the lows down, takes some of the highs down, brings up the middle. You know, makes it a bit cleaner. It'll normalize it to minus three decibels, and then I will denoise it, declick it, and pretty much leave it there. Now there is a shortcut if anyone wants to know, if you have breaths in your track and you don't want them, if you go to dynamics and you cut all the lows at like minus 35 decibels, that usually catches most breaths depending on how loud you record. I leave my breaths in and I'll tell you why. So then once that's audio is done, I put the video and audio files into Premiere and then I'll sync up the audio to the video. Typically what I do is before recording, I just do a clap like that and then I'll go into the video file and I'll line the frame of my hands clapping up with that sound and I'll line that up. It's usually like three frames off, um, which is which comes out to like 0 0.1, 0 0.01 seconds maybe. It's very minor. Um, but once that's synced up, uh, I'm actually glad I did that because I don't think I synced up my audio before I recorded this. Oops. What is outside right now? I live next to an intersection, so every now and then when I record during the day, there's just loud ass cars out there. <laughs> so I hope you can't hear that. If you can, sorry. Um, but that's so distracting. I think I'll just cut this out. But once they're both into Premiere, uh, then the editing starts. And my editing process is pretty straightforward. I actually just started using this tool called AutoCut. It's really, really helpful. Um, it's a, uh, extension somebody made for Premiere that will go through your file and just cut out all the silences. And that's so useful because editing what I call the bottom edit. I don't know if that's the correct term, but doing the bottom edit is when I just like get just a pure good edited video file before I do any effects, music, sound effects, anything like that. Um, that always took the longest for me. So having that trimmed down time has been super helpful. Um, but what it will do is I'll line them up, I'll have auto cut, take out all the silences, but you'll notice I left the breaths in. Um, this is that time where then I go through and I re I go through the whole video myself on Premiere. I will delete the outtakes and I'll delete the breaths, which leaves a very quick high speed video because attention span is key and none of us have it. So <laughs> I'll go through and I'll take out all the breaths, all that, and I'll, I'll, I'll line it up in a way that I'm um, like, okay, this is the length and speed of the final video. Then I start back at the beginning and do the effects, the sounds, the transitions, all the stuff like that. Um, and by the time I'm done, we're talking about like a 25 to 30 hour process. And that's my making a theory. Like that's, that's my week right there. Usually I finish around Thursday night or Friday morning. So some days if a video doesn't get published on the channel to like Friday evening, it's because I'm running late frankly, like I'm editing all day Friday. If it, like, like if a video isn't ready by Thursday night, my Friday is just editing. And my wife has to take care of both the kids and bless her. She is the main reason this channel can even function properly. Um, and besides that, um, I do, uh, uh I, I've, I should address also that some people have been worried that I'm going to burn myself out, which maybe we'll see. Um, but Especially with this podcast, I saw a lot of people like, hey, you're doing a lot of content. And that's true. So for anyone who doesn't know, starting September this month, uh, my weekly schedule is going to look like this. Sunday, podcast. Monday is going to be a stream on the Rytus channel and a short on the Rytus channel. Tuesday is a short on the Rytost channel and a stream on the Rytos channel. Wednesday, we've got a full Rytus video. Then Thursday, we're getting a... Um, the only thing on Thursday is a stream on the Rytus channel. And then Friday will be a full Rytos video and a Rytos stream. Saturday, a Rytus short. So there's content coming out every day. Is that too much? I don't know, is frankly my answer. Because let's break it down granularly, right? Um, I what I what The only thing I personally am doing is, make, is making and editing 
the shorts and videos on Rytoast and edit and making it editing this this podcast and streaming. All the edited content on Rytoast, somebody else does. You know, like I hired those two editors. So ideally, it's not too much. I don't know. But that's enough content talk, right? We're 30 minutes in. We've barely talked about FNAF. Let's talk more about FNAF. So we'll go to our next question, shall we? From Sal Martin 27 Sal on Twitter. Uh, do you find FNAF enjoyable? I know there has to be some enjoyment to it, but I feel like especially being part of your career and daily life can make it complicated. I think that's a really good question. I do like, I'll be straight up honest. If I didn't like and feel passion behind what I was doing on this channel, I wouldn't be doing it. Right? Like if I didn't like FNAF, I wouldn't be making these videos. I wouldn't be making content about it. I would still be making content. I've always wanted to make content, but I wouldn't be making it about FNAF if I didn't enjoy FNAF as a franchise. I mean, hell, I I bought that Foxy plush way before I had this channel, right? Like I, I really do like FNAF as a franchise. Um, does it get a little draining sometimes? You could say that. I think I have a very interesting relationship with FNAF because in my real world, like the real people and friends and family I have, zero of them give a shit about Five Nights at Freddy's. So uh, I have no one to talk to about it, which does help the content because I save all my thoughts for the content. Um, <laughs> so I, I think I'm not as entrenched in, in it as I could be um, if I knew more people that in real life that liked it then I probably would be more into it. Like one of my other big passions is One Piece, but it helps that my wife really also really, really likes One Piece. So because we both really, really like it, we can rant about it for like hours at a time, which makes me like One Piece way more, you know? So I wouldn't say FNAF is my favorite thing ever or anything even close to that, but it's probably in my top 10 franchises, I would say. I really like the concept in the franchise and I like horror games, so it worked out for me. Um, but I, I do see... It does occasionally get draining. Um, I, I can definitely say that. Um, and that was a pretty succinct one. So let's move on, I guess, to at DenverCav04 on Twitter. Denver, uh, thank you for the question. I should be thanking everybody. Thank you for your questions, everybody. Um, a random thought I just had, but if Scott answered one question about FNAF's lore, what question would give the most information? I feel like that would be a fun video someone could make. That's interesting. I've never had that question posed to me in that way. Like, typically the question is, what's the one lore thing you want Scott to answer? But the idea of, like, what would be the question that would give us the most answers without being like, hey, what's the timeline, you know? No, that's interesting. I'll say this before we get into that. My probably the question, and a lot of people have this one, but the question I have the most for Scott, I have two. So Scott, if you're watching this, listen, there's not that many FNAF podcasts out there. So there's a chance you're here. Scott, if you're here, I'm beg, I'm on my knees begging. It's not lore related. Please, dear Lord, Scott, God in heaven, I respect your religion. Did not mean to do that. Um, please. Are the Tales books in continuity or not? That's all I want to know. It, are the Tales in the Pizzaplex books fully in continuity or not? Because I still am not sure. Like, I, don't get me wrong. And this is where this, and we're going to definitely do a full podcast episode on just this topic. I guarantee you we will. Um, but it's not that I don't want them to be in continuity or even that I don't think they can be. I just, I'm not convinced yet, you know? I'm at least not convinced enough to say that it's confirmed. I don't know where the idea that the Tales books being confirmed to be in continuity comes from. Like, I know that there's the same... Uh, here's my perspective on it, right? The From what I... From, as I'm aware, the main evidence being used for the Tales books being in continuity is that it describes the Pizzaplex exactly as is and has some characters from the games. But, like, so does the Silver Eyes, Right? Now, granted, the Silver Eyes definitely aren't in continuity because, like, when you get to when you learn more about these characters, you're like, oh, well, William Afton doesn't die by the hands of these kids. William Afton dies in a back room. But that's because we know all of the story, right? With the Tales books, we're not getting all of the story. We're getting little Goosebumps esque mini stories. So we don't have that context to fully deconfirm these books. So, from what I can see and what's been presented to me, there's three main arguments for the continuity of the Tales books being in the game universe. 
And I want to be very clear on that. I keep saying continuity, not canon. Obviously, the books are canon. Every piece of FNAF merchandise and FNAF content is canon canon but we're talking about the game's timeline and are these books in the game's timeline when it comes with the tales books there's three arguments i see being made the most often there's the scholastic description there is the locations and there's the locations and characters from the books that make direct crossovers and then i think that's the two arguments actually we'll split locations and characters so with the first one I'm going to be super real. I don't give a shit what Scholastic says about the books because Scholastic isn't Scott and Scholastic isn't the author. Like I could not care less that Scholastic said it takes place in the FNAF universe, right? Like, okay, cool. That's not evidence. Like that's an advertisement. Furthermore, even if it was like directly from Scott or the author, I've been over this a hundred times. I'm an English major, all right? I'm not saying I'm the be all end all of this, but from my perspective, set in the universe of does not mean is within the game's timeline. Like those are two separate things. The Super Mario Brothers movie that just came out, that's set in the Mario Brothers universe 100%, but it's not canon to the games, obviously, you know? So like it's, it, this, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's in continuity. And then if we're talking about the, locations we've kind of already went over that in silver eyes but like in silver eyes they describe fredbear's family diner and it's pretty close they describe freddy fazbear's pizza and although the freddy fazbear's we know isn't in a mall um the freddy fazbear's pizza we know is very similar to that with like the hallways the security office foxy having his own stage you know it's very similar but it doesn't mean it's in continuity and then as far as characters go i yeah I mean, they would show up, but like just because William Afton is in a book doesn't mean that book is in continuity. So I, I don't see for me personally, I'm not convinced they are in continuity, but I can say for a fact, I don't think there's nearly as much evidence as necessary to insist that everyone has to assume they are 100 percent in continuity like you can do that. I, I see no problem with doing theories and videos assuming that the books are 100% in continuity. That's totally fine. I've never said you can't do that. My opinion is I don't think that you can say that it is confirmed that they are and that anyone who disagrees is stupid or gaslighting themselves. Like that's the, the whole point of theorizing is having fun with this. And I've seen people ever since like, the leaks from the eighth book come out. I feel like most people have kind of calmed on that because mo I, f I feel like it's coming around where most people are like, yeah, just think whatever you want. As long as you're not like, just like do, do whatever you want. You know what I mean? Like I've seen more of that recently. So hopefully it's going to be changing, but it, the community has been very toxic about that debate specifically on both sides. Um, so hopefully that'll change. Um, that was a whole book tangent, but that was my first question. That, uh, if I could ask Scott anything, I'd ask him that. And then if we're talking lore, it wouldn't give us the most information by far, but I think this question I would ask lore-based, I, I feel like most people agree with, hey, Scott, what the hell did you mean by Midnight Motorist? Like, we're not, we're, we're missing something. It Something didn't track. But if we're talking about what question for Scott would give us the most information, Midnight Motorist isn't there, but it is close, right? Because it would tell, I feel like if Midnight Motorist is as important as we think it is, that is a lot of information. But I think like the most succinct question that would give us the most information would have to do with the indie game dev. So with Help Wanted, it introduced the idea that the older games in the franchise are in-universe games made by a rogue indie developer that was actually hired by Fazbear to cover up things that happened. So I think if we could ask one question to get the most information for this franchise, it would be, hey, Scott, what did that mean? Right? Like, what were you trying to tell us in that lore dump? Are you saying to throw out those older games? Or are you just saying that, like, if you guys make a lore mistake on the older games, go with what you guys said and just forget that piece of the older games chalk it up to the indie game dev that's what i've been assuming i assume the indie game dev is less a retcon and more a tool that steelwell and scott can now use or if they have a really good idea for the story that they can't do because of something from fnaf 2 they can just 
go with that cool idea and say that thing in FNAF 2 isn't canon anymore. So I think it really comes down to two things that they're going to mostly be much more loose on, and that's animatronic design and 8-bit minigames. I think those are the two things that will really, like, be less emphasized. Things like, like, I remember the good old, the good old days of FNAF where we were counting bear toes. You know, that's not going to be the case anymore. And I think Steel Wool is showing us that with Ruin, right? Because these animatronics were like almost fully redesigned. They have new endoskeletons. Freddy has a prototype stamp on his foot now and a gift inside of him. Does that mean they're all different animatronics and this is like a different timeline? I don't think so. I think this is them leaning on that indie game dev territory where the design and the like minute details aren't as important. They still are important. Like they still come up and they're still important, but they're not the be all end all anymore. I think that's kind of where that's going. We're at 40 minutes. So we're over a half hour. If I have a guest, it'll probably be a longer, like an hour. I don't know what precedent I want to set for length here. I mean, I have one more question. So I guess we can do that and see where we end up. Yeah, we'll do one last question. I, I I grabbed four questions, so I guess we can do that. And if there's a tangent, there's a tangent. So this is from at marionette1987. <laughs> I didn't realize the username is literally at marionette1987 or, or the puppet on Twitter. Thank you for your question. Is the mimic possessed by remnant slash agony or is it purely AI? At this point in the games, I don't know if we have a, I, I don't think there's a clear answer on that. I think it could go either way. I'm where I'm at right now with the mimic, right? And I, I don't want to go too deep into the mimic because I could do a whole video on just the mimic. But if we're talking about the mimic and remnant and AI and agony, it's definitely murky water. But one of the more clear ideas I have is the difference between the mimic that we see in ruin and the mimic we see in security breach. And I'm talking specifically the physical mimic. So the mimic and burn trap where I do believe burn trap is the mimic. So where I'm at right now, I feel like one of the things ruin was showing us and the books to an extent is that the mimics eyes being white is telling us that it's not currently under the influence of agony. So one of the things in the books is that the Mimic's eyes are always very like white, orange, something like that. And in Ruin, we see that too, where it's just an endoskeleton, these big white, orangish eyes. But in Security Breach, the Mimic's eyes are black and purple because it's Burn Trap at the time. So in the books and somewhat in FNAF AR, we see Agony turn things black like uh, Shadow Bonnie is fully black or like in Hide and Seek, that entity is like a big shadow behind the kid. So, and with the encyclopedia, it doesn't, it, I don't think it ever says agony, but it describes it as dark remnant. So I've, I've had this theory kicking around in my head that agony and remnant are kind of like yin and yang to each other where we have remnant and dark remnant where it's like remnant is the spirit and emotions of the deceased whereas agony is the agony they felt during it um i because the eyes of the mimic were fully purple and black as burn trap i think that tells us that william's soul is gone right here's where i think happened i feel like the mimic was introduced or found to William Afton's remains, right? Whatever was left in that husk of a, of a spring Bonnie suit, because now that we know Glamrock Bonnie is still fully intact, just broken and destroyed. We know that the parts on, <clears throat> we know that the parts on burn trap aren't Glamrock Bonnie. That's spring trap for sure. So if that's true, what I think probably happened is the mimic, as it likes to do, saw a costume and put it on. And when it put on Burn Trap's suit and Vanny maybe helped modify it or something like that um, to fit better, William's soul, I think, is still in Ultimate Custom Night. I think William's soul and uh, remnant is still trapped within Ultimate Custom Night. But his agony could very well still be infected in the items that he was wearing. So what I think happened is the mimic itself is 99% AI, if not fully AI. But when it put on Springtrap and put on that scrapped up suit and corpse, William Afton's agony infected it. And that might be why the mimic was so antagonistic in the security breach and ruin. Is that true? 
No. I mean, it's it's not confirmed. Is that confirmed? Not at all. Is it likely? Maybe. But that's I think that's where I'm at right now without doing further brainstorming on it. You got a very loud motorcycle outside if you can't hear it. Um, you definitely heard that, though. Oh, my God. Why is every car so loud when I record? Anyway... The recording's at 45 minutes, with what I cut out, probably closer to 40 minutes. But I feel like that's a good length, you know, for a solo podcast. Um, when we have guests on, it'll probably be closer to an hour, hour and a half. Um, I don't know, but this feels like a good length. I guess let me know in the comments if this feels like a good length for a podcast. But I guess for now, we'll wrap it up. So I just want to thank everybody for hanging out and doing this experience with me. If a couple months go by and nobody really cares about the podcast, I'll probably just stop doing it. But if you guys like it, I'll be happy to make more of them. Let me know. Um, comments are likes, shares, always appreciated to get the word out for a new project like this. But like I said at the beginning, if you have any comments, if you or if you have any questions you want answered on the, the on the podcast, if you have any theories that we could review on the podcast, or if you have any guests that you want me to try to reach out to, um, the emails in the description, it's right here. Freddie Fazbear pizza podcast at gmail.com. All podcast request related things will go there. Um, but for now, I think that does it for episode one. So thank you all so much for hanging out with me on this new venture. Hopefully you like the laid back slower kind of content. And I guess I'll see you next week. Um, do I have an outro yet? I didn't think of one. I recorded the intro, but I never recorded like, I didn't script out a proper outro. Um, I don't want to just say stay toasty because that's for the videos. Huh. You know what? That's your comment prompt. Comment below what a good outro phrase could be that I can just like say and end on that. So comment below or send an email in about like what you think a good outro phrase could be. And we'll do that. Because if you can't think of something good yourself, you outsource. Um, all right. We'll see you next Sunday. Bye.